conversation we're going to have. So just a few more seconds and then we'll officially get started. I'm watching the attendee number climb and when it plateaus, we'll get started. I would say talk amongst yourselves, but I don't think that's something feasible right now, but we'll try to get some audience participation going on later. All right, let's get started. So good afternoon, good evening, and good morning as your time zone dictates. My name is Uche Amechi. I'm a lecturer here at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, and I'd love to welcome all of you to today's Education Now episode. So Education Now, in case you don't know, is a webinar series designed to respond to the dramatic changes in the field of education in the wake of COVID-19. Looking forward to today's conversation, where we'll discuss the challenges we've seen in this uncertain time, and this uncertain year of stacked crises, and hopefully our ideas for addressing some of these challenges will broaden the conversation beyond what students and faculty and families like yourselves have missed or lost, and also turn our attention to how to move forward from where we are now. And like I said earlier to some of those who came in earlier, we're looking forward to getting some Q&A, so getting some of your thoughts and ideas into the conversation. We hope you'll find some of what we're saying practical and inspirational. And as we explore the actionable ideas and the larger issues of equity um, to work in student, with the students in our communities. But before we get started, a few housekeeping matters. So today's episode is being recorded and will be available to view um, on the Harvard Education YouTube channel and our Facebook page. Yes, we do have both. And you can also visit um, us at hgse.me forward slash ed now, that's forward slash E-D-N-O-W for recordings and information about this episode and future episodes. So you can submit your questions via the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And also you will find um, the ability to turn on closed captions if you need that. Also at the bottom of your screen. All right, so I'm gonna give you five seconds to do that. Good, let's go. All right, so I would love to welcome our esteemed panel of my esteemed colleagues and friends from the Harvard Ed School who bring distinct perspectives and expertise to the conversation. So um, today we have Andrew Ho. Andrew is an expert on student testing and learning loss, and we'll ask him some questions about that topic and perhaps some other things. Stephanie Jones, um, Stephanie's work focuses on children's social and emotional and behavior development and on the kind of learning that can support it. Paul Revel leads the Harvard Education Redesign Lab and partners with mayors, superintendents and civic and community leaders to help reimagine education. And last but definitely not least, my friend, Mary Grass O'Neill heads Hudsey's School Leadership Program and is a former superintendent, principal, teacher, and curriculum advisor. So welcome all around to all of you folks. Looking forward to the conversation. Y'all doing pretty well? Yeah, yeah. excellent. Yes, thank you, Che. All right, so let's kick it off with just a general question and um, whoever wants to go first, just jump in. So the topic of this conversation is really like look, moving forward and thinking about the fall. So I'm curious, what's on the top of mind for each of you if you look forward into the year? So perhaps a significant concern or challenge you're focused on, um, whether you have an idea or not about how to address that challenge. So just what's top of mind? Stephanie, I'll start. You jump. There you go. <laughs> all I want to do is start with that question and jump in because um, because we all have lots of things that we're worried about. It's in fact it's hard to pick just one. So um, I'm going to respond to your question by picking a couple, and hopefully they'll they'll lead us into a whole conversation about a whole lot of interesting things. I am worried, um, as I think we all are, about. Um, the issues tied to learning loss or missed opportunities. And I'm, I'm worried about that that's happened, but I'm also worried about the language of it and how that can become sticky and applied to children who might view themselves as, as having lost something that they might never get back. And related to that, I'm worried about how that could lead to lots of pressure 
and rushing at a time that is going to continue to be turbulent and uncertain and uh, stressful for educators, for children, for their families. And so I would offer in response something that is the opposite of rushing, which is slowing down and spending time on children's and adults' social and emotional needs. And I would say, put that right in the front at the beginning and really give it time and care. And that might mean uh, doing lots of talking about people's experiences and their emotions, sharing together what's happened, really carefully setting up expectations and rituals because it's going to feel and look different in classrooms, of course, because we have new things that we're expected to do. And then I'm going to throw in there, play games. Give kids and adults a chance to play games. It's a great way to reconnect and to also practice some new rituals and for kids to reconnect with each other. Wow. Thank you, Stephanie. Very Hi, Mary. thoughtful. Mary, I'm wondering, because I know that you work with principals, teach, lead, teachers, leaders, and so on and so forth. Do you have any thoughts on what Stephanie said and what, what's on your mind? So I absolutely love, Stephanie, the notion of fun. Um, <laughs> learning is so much fun. And sometimes we don't communicate that in our schools. So um, I love that you're talking about fun. And what's on my mind, um, of course, for all of us, the people who've been lost over this last year and a half, we treasure their memories. And in their honor as educators, We've been pledging to do our best work and, and live our lives to the fullest. Now, educators and leaders are on my mind, and they have been so busy helping their students, families, and communities um, that to do their best work, I think a priority for them is to put self-care on the top of their list. And we can take a lesson from the airlines here on every single airline flight you've taken. You've been told, we've all been told, put your oxygen masks on first before helping someone else. So even if you're holding your child in your lap, we're supposed to put on our oxygen masks first and breathe deeply. And our educators and leaders really need to breathe, deep, breathe deeply because our students and their families really need us now and they're counting on us. So whatever self-care looks like for you, do it. Whether it is fitness, family, hobbies, walking, exercising, reading, spending time with friends, spending time alone, talking to that counselor, taking a class, cooking, dancing, playing. Uh, we have a common theme here, playing, having fun, engaging in team or individual sports. Um, take time to do what you enjoy. Now at Harvard this past week, we're mourning the loss of our friend, colleague and mentor, Roland Bach who died a week ago. Throughout his outstanding career, founding the Principal Center at Harvard, uh, being a teacher himself and a principal and a writer, um, this is something he wrote that has always stuck with me. He said, the nature of relationships among the adults within a school has a greater influence on the character and quality of that school and on student accomplishment than anything else. If the relationship between administrators and teachers are uh, trusting, generous, helpful, and cooperative than the relationships between teachers and students, between students and students, and between teachers and parents are likely to be trusting, generous, helpful, and cooperative. If on the other hand, relationships between administrators and teachers are fearful, competitive, suspicious, and corrosive, then these qualities will disseminate throughout the school community. We know these things, but we need to work on them, work on ourselves first, then work on showing care, concern, trust, uh, and developing healthy relationships with our colleagues. We have a program right here at HDSE led by our very talented colleague, Rick Weisbord. The program is called Making Caring Common. And Making Caring Common is dedicated to raising kids who care about others and the common good. So put the students into the mix too. Help them demonstrate caring, concern, and the common good. They have a web website. It's called, no surprise, Making Caring Common. So take care of yourself first, 
then you can create the trusting, generous, helpful, and cooperative school or district where you want to work. And at the same time, you can have some fun. Thank you for all of that, Mary. Thanks. And thank you for thank you for taking us back and just having us remember those who we've lost over the past year, because I'm sure professionally, personally, there's just been so much in terms of loss. And I love that metaphor that you just brought up again of putting your oxygen mask back on. And that and a lot of what you said, I think tightly connects to what Stephanie was talking about. Take care of ourselves first and then relax and that'll help us help the students relax, which will then actually help us as we start to think about how to move forward. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much. Paul, I'm wondering if you have some thoughts um, on some of what you've heard and then I'm also thinking about just what's top of your mind. Well, I have a lot of thoughts on what I've heard from the <laughs> two folks who've spoken before me. I try and work them into what I'm concerned about. If I had to sum it up in a single word, it would be inertia. <clears throat> I worry about the tendency in our system to define success in the challenges that we're looking toward at the moment as a kind of return to the status quo ante. Uh, we, uh, we sort of work in a system, our K-12 system specifically, um, that's a legacy system, that's a fairly conservative system that has changed relatively little over time. And prior to the pandemic, was not nearly serving from an equity standpoint, all of our students in the way that they need to be served if they're to aspire to the middle class, to be able to become successful as uh, employees, as citizens, as lifelong learners, as family heads. So uh, I'm hoping that we can work together to define kind of a new normal. Everybody wants a some kind of normal to grab onto and create security and predictability in the system. Um, but the normal shouldn't be what we used to have because what we used to have was inadequate. So as we look forward, thinking about those things that worked well in what we did with students and teachers and with the system overall prior to the pandemic and what didn't work so well and try and subtract and discard those things that didn't work so well. We're not very good in our sector at subtraction. We're pretty good at adding programs all the time, but we're not very good at subtracting them and apply the same standard to all of our adaptations. I think we had some uh, terrific adaptations during the pandemic, some things that we moved toward that previously we've been reluctant to embrace because of that inertia, because of that conservatism. You know, technology, just to take one single example, virtually overnight, the world of education, many of us personally were catapulted into embracing a technology that our sector had been relatively reluctant, had been kind of a laggard sector in embracing. And now we've sort of moved past the emergency response and we're getting better at applying it to harness the power of really the universe toward accelerating learning and we can get better at that. So that's an example of something, you know, some of the kinds of changes that happen and I'll talk more about some of them later. So, so redesigning for this new normal, which really means, I mean, to go to, to some of the things that Stephanie and, and uh, Mary we're talking about is reconnecting relationships. I mean, I worry that if we look at learning loss as a technical function, in other words, we've lost X amount of time, we've got to figure out how to replace it in Y amount of time, and we've got to gin up the pressure, uh, as um, Stephanie was talking about earlier, we will have missed the point altogether. We have students who've been alienated uh, from our school systems altogether, disconnected entirely. And so the first order of business really has to be relational, connecting them back to their teachers with whom they've had frag fragmented or fractured altogether relationships with their peers. With the act and the whole endeavor of learning, of being in school, with their sense of inspiration and hope in the work they do, uh, you know, to their motivation that they bring to the work. So all of that, I think, needs to be there, that reconnection. And in the end, I think uh, a good design principle for thinking about constructing the new normal is Let's look at our children and think about meeting them where they are and giving them what they need, both inside and outside of school. Treat them as though they were our own children. 
and we have the resources and supports and disposition to differentiate between them, and uh, which I think suggests a different kind of model of education than we currently have right now. But those conversations, listening to them, listening to their families about what needs to be in place in order to get them reconnected and learning again, I think would be a good place for us to start. That's awesome, Paul. Thank you so much. And thank you for bringing it back to the relationships and, and relational. Um, I was really thinking about how you were saying we need to take a step back. It is not a technical problem, this question of learning loss. We need to understand why. And there's so many things that you talked about and relationships are part of understanding why and part of how we move forward. And indeed, Mary, I was looking through the um, Q&A and some people, they love that paragraph that you read and they would, and we'll figure out a way, right? To share it out because yes, thank I, think, you. I, think, I think Jody's all over this already. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay. And before we go to Andrew, I'd love to um, get some of your thoughts on what are some of the things that are top on your mind, your primary concerns for your students. So this is to the folks who are watching or listening in. So if we could get that poll up and then we'll share some of the, um, the results in a little bit. But as that's happening, Andrew, I'd love to hear what's top of your mind. You're, you're giving me a chance to bias the poll, Ujay. So uh, um, I, uh, uh, I, I think I might be positioned here um, if uh, people in the audience don't know me as like a potential debater, right? I do work with educational tests. So uh, one might think naively that I'm here to argue that we should be paying much more attention to those tests. And of course, for those of you who know me better, you know that the exact opposite is true and that I agree very, very strongly with my colleagues that we're, we have been for a couple of decades now pretty dangerously out of balance when it comes to our emphasis on test scores uh, over and above um, physical health and, and mental health. And that has only come to the fore um, uh, through, the, through the past um, year and a half. Um, and I think you know, one of the, the, the helpful um, uh, conceptual models for this is a hierarchy of needs, right? And in, in, in a case um, like in a situation like the one we've been in over the past year and a half, it's very clear that we have to prioritize physical health. And then after that, mental and social and emotional health. Uh, and then maybe after that, there'll be time for some learning. And this is exactly the priorities that I've taken to my students in my own classes over the past year and a half. Uh, we'd be crazy to say, okay, now you have to learn fixed, ra fixed effects, random effects in classical test theory when we're in mourning. We, as, as everyone has said, we are in mourning. Um, and so that is absolutely the right um, set of priorities to, to have and to hold. And so here I'm, I, am, I might be biasing the poll in a, <laughs> in a particular direction, but I have kids in school and I have kids that I teach and my primary concern for them is health. Um, and, uh, and you know, my, my girls just picked them up from school and it's constantly on my mind. Neither of them is vaccinated yet. Um, and I, so I'm, I'm, it's, it's clearly my, my number one anxiety. Um, that said, I don't think um, anything in education has to be either or. Um, and one of the really important findings alongside uh, other data that we have uh, is data on um, a proficiency with uh, educational tests, right? Um, and so again, I see this as an opportunity to step back and think about data collection for an educational census, right? It's less about testing than first asking, again, physical health, mental health, and then maybe learning, where are our kids? Are all of them still here, right? Let's start looking at who's still in school. Let's start looking at who's actually attending right? Those come first and foremost. Are they here and are they engaged, right? After that, we can start to look at other measures, but I don't think this has to be either or. Um, and, and that I do believe um, that it's still important for me to know where, um, where my daughters stand when it comes to their reading and mathematics. And I still think that that's important. Now, to what um, this idea is, is, has come up about learning loss, right? I would love to put a firewall between um, the way that we talk about test scores to policymakers who are in charge of funding and priorities and to teachers and parents, right? There's one way we should talk about this as indeed a national emergency that requires indeed $190 billion in federal aid, right? And here in Massachusetts, you know, $2.8 billion, right, of money to, uh, to be flowing to our schools right now. And that is the right set of priorities and the right kind of urgency. But there is another way that we should talk, and exactly the way that I think my colleagues have, uh, have um, framed it, 
to our parents, our children, and our teachers. And we have to make sure that they are coming, um, uh, they're looking forward to, to teaching and engaging with students from a position of strength and from a position of assets, right? Um, and one of, the, one of the most dangerous things that test scores have done in the history of test scores is propagate deficit frames. Right, that there are these gaps and, and missing pieces in our kids' heads and they have to be filled. And that clearly is not the case, but there is also a debt that we owe schools in our society that must be paid. And so to try to, our, 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 to be careful about how we talk about the priorities of, of schools and how important they are, and we can see the effects when we don't have them, uh, while also not propagating deficit frameworks in the heads of kids and among parents and teachers is the fine line we have to walk because there have been losses and there are opportunities and we have to build from strengths and from assets. How is that for two minutes, UJ? Are we all sticking to the time limit? Uh, I stopped looking at the clock a while back, so I think we're good. Um, I would love to stay with you though, Andrew, because um, I love what you're saying. And I, so there's kind of this, this whole thing around, it's not about extremes, it's not either or. We're, let's figure out how to actually work. It's all about nuance and then talk, and then the prioritization that you just talked through. So I'm generally curious about what are your findings um, about the effect of the pandemic's disruption on learning loss. You kind of alluded to some of this. And ultimately, eventually, I'm gonna, I wanna hear a little bit more about how do we kind of straddle this middle ground, this gray area between messaging one way and messaging another way and so on and so forth. But what have you found about, or what do you know, either from your research or from other research about the pandemic's impact? Right, and uh, and here, uh, you know, my this this is not this is not my joke, Paul. I can blame it on my advisor, but he, you know, he used to say that if you give policymakers two numbers, they'll just average them. <laughs> so, so so it's like, how can we keep all of these, you know, numbers and priorities in our heads at the same time? Mm -hmm. And so there is a danger again by talking about learning loss and focusing on the test scores. For example, here in Massachusetts, that just came out yesterday, mm -hmm. right? Sixteen percentage points in math, six uh, a decline, and six um, six percentage points in reading and English language arts in grades three through eight. And we sum all of that up and immediately we're like deficit frame, right? Mm -hmm. And also that that's the only thing that matters, right? And not the fact that we've lost so many kids, that there's so much anxiety around um, health and, uh, and a, a, a decreasing attendance and decreasing engagement. So how can we keep all of what I just said, physical health, mental health, social health, emotional health here, Right, while also saying, and yes, uh, there's also 16 percentage point declines in math and six percentage point mm -hmm. declines in reading, and that that mirrors what we see in states uh, and other um, uh, district level tests throughout the country, right? Greater declines in math because why? Of course, we do much less, I do much less talking about math with my kids at home than, uh, than we tend to at school. And so we expect those declines. And also potentially we hope to see those gains um, when, when uh, kids return to school. Um, uh, that, uh, and we hope that those gains are steeper when we return as well. But I guess, again, can we keep more than one priority in our minds at the same time? I hope so. Right. Can we triangulate among this? And can we remember too, that the different numbers across different districts and different schools and different groups helps us to set priorities. Priorities for the $2.8 billion here in Massachusetts and $190 billion um, across this country. Then that's just at the federal level, not to mention the states. Um, and I'm, I am putting a little plug into the chat about one of many, um, this is one from a great um, organization called Future Ed, um, but there are many playbooks out there that have lists of strategies that districts and states and schools can use uh, to deploy with that um, considerable, um, uh, unprecedented amount of funding and support um, that our government has rightly given to our schools and to our um, educational communities. Mm. Thank you, Andrew. So Andrew, I had a very interesting yes. conversation. In my, may I respond, Uche? Oh, go for it, yes. I was actually gonna ask for that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. On this whole, Thing about you know deficit versus you know what kids have gained and so I talked to some in preparing for this webinar I talked to some educators who were saying oh my goodness this the, the first graders or the second graders can't remember how to write their last name or they don't know how to use the crayons they dumped all the crayons out on the table mm -hmm. instead of taking out the one they wanted to use or a little girl went missing because she went to the restroom on her own. I think she's been doing at home, right? But, um, and people couldn't understand where did she go? Or taking out a snack when it wasn't really snack time. 
So these are routines and the routines have to be reinforced with kids. I talked to another um, a principal this was who said, you know, we learned so much about what our kids can do in a remote world. And the shifts our teachers pull together quickly and successfully without any preparation, K to five, never even had Chromebooks. She said, I am super impressed by the kids' technical skills. On Zoom, kids explaining some features, they know how to share their screen and change their virtual backgrounds better than the adults. The kids found different ways to G chat and send emails. And they figured out they can message anyone who's online. So as the principal, I'm getting these messages saying, hi, how are you? And I go right back saying, I think you should be in math right now. Go back to class. Thanks for your message. But, you know, she said, we have to focus on what the kids learn. She said, they've learned how to be more independent. Um, they know how to um, participate in ways they never did before. We don't use this deficit lens. She used your exact term, Andrew. She said they learned many things, things that we wouldn't have imagined, like how to be independent, how to demonstrate courage, how to have organizational skills and responsibility, how to take charge of themselves, sometimes have increased home responsibilities, taking care of others while at home. And they learned that life doesn't end with hardships or the pandemics. So we're not measuring that, of course, on the MCAS. I agree with you 100%. We got to get those scores up because every single one of us who has kids or has had kids or has nieces, nephews, neighbors, relatives, we those scores count because they matter. But I think you like hit the nail right on the head, Andrew. Mary, so, if I could go ahead, Stephanie. Well, I just wanted to add one little um, addition to Mary's really helpful comment that builds on Andrew's, which is we should be ready to look for growth in unexpected places. So, so, and it, it circles back to Paul's big comment about um, let's try not to return to the status quo ante and, and look for growth and opportunity and all the kinds of great things that kids can do that they bring into it in places we don't expect it. And, and we'll see it, it will be there, absolutely. We just need to be systematic and focused on it. We need to see it and raise it up and take advantage of what kids are bringing in and that they're excited about. Like, let's think about what, they're, what they want us to know about them that engages them. And then those are the places where we can look for growth in, in ways that we might not expect it otherwise. I love the way where this conversation has been going, this focus on this assets-based perspective that Andrew, you kind of introduced into the conversation, but it was also, I think, embedded in everything that came before. We keep saying we need to do this, we need to. So Mary, maybe I'm gonna come back to you and then I'd love to pull back everybody else. So we would be the educators, the leaders, the teachers in the classroom, the paraprofessionals, maybe people working in the office. So it's been a heck of a year, stat crises, the pandemic, we're still trying to, probably there's even more unpredictability in the next few months as we try to figure out where, which way we're trending. So, and it's not consistent across the country as we know in terms of vaccination rates, laws and so on and so forth. So Mary, I'm curious if you could say a little bit more, where are the teachers and the leaders now? What do they need? Um, Perhaps if there's momentum for what came before over the last year, perhaps if things are actually changing now in terms of what they need and what supports they're getting. So this we that's supposed to help make all of this possible for our children, how are we gonna, how are we gonna support we, so to speak? So of course we need to have strong leaders in every school, every bit of the research will tell you that you can't have a great school without a great principal. We've got a national shortage. We fortunately are preparing people at our school um, to go into these roles and we need really strong people and we need to support them in any way that we can. Because in any crisis, it's the leader who has to lead the community through it. If there's a death at, of someone at the school, my son happens to be a teacher. He teaches the oldest child of the professor at BU who just had that terrible accident at the MBTA and died. And he said, well, this is just so much pressure, mom on the teachers to get the whole team through, to get all the kids through this. So everyone looks to the principal, the leader. What should we do? What should we say? What kind of memorial should we have? What should we do about getting kids to services? How can this go? So 
we need to really help the principals to do more self-care than anybody else um, mm -hmm. and to be, you know, really looking on the bright side. If you talk to any principal, the first thing they'll tell you is we need those resources. So Andrew threw out those big numbers and every district is getting some resources. Um, I learned in Boston Public Schools, what they're doing with some of their resources is they have tapped into a 24 seven tutoring system where students can get tutoring in their own languages. And apparently there are other big districts across the country who are using this. And so this is gonna be a helpful way for kids to at any time, 24 seven, um, help with tutoring. They'll look at your papers before you submit them, give you feedback. Um, I thought, wow, I wish they had that when I was in school. <laughs> so I think there are things that we can do sometimes. What do they need? They need money. They need the resources to do what needs to be done. But I never like to focus on that. Um, there are things we can do that don't cost any money. And the mm -hmm. kinds of things that we have been discussing here don't cost millions and millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. So we, we need to put the best people we can um, in front of our kids. That's what we all want. Um, and we need to realize that, you know, the principal, it turns out, is the single most important person in the building. They affect the whole school, who gets to teach there, who gets to stay, who's asked to leave or move on. Um, mm -hmm. They affect the education of every single child in that school. So uh, the more we can do with principals and helping them and supporting them will help us all in our schools. But mm -hmm. we need it too. I mean, we're in higher ed. I'm sure there are people in higher ed who are on this call who are saying, wow, you know, do we do this? What do we do? How do we help people? Um, one of the things that I said, yeah, I'm going to see if I get a chance. I'm going to mention that, you know, our dean and our leadership team has been brave, courageous, and bold. I mean, in terms of technology, like we just pivoted so quickly, just like people had to do. And people are coming to Harvard, they expect us to be excellent and be really strong teachers. And, you know, we struggled with it too. Like, how do we do this? How do we make this mm -hmm. work? How do you make groups? We need some of those kids, you know, who are in those elementary schools who learned how to make groups and change your virtual backgrounds, helping us out here. But um, I think that was huge. We took in these classes. I mean, I think I always like this quote from Churchill, which is never let a good crisis go to waste. Mm -hmm. And our school <laughs> has not let it go to waste. We have made profound changes in a 400 year old school that people never would have expected. And without the pandemic, we likely would not be as far ahead as we are in terms of using technology it's and using all these kinds of skills and being able to teach people who are living across the world and bringing Harvard there. It's, it's been magnificent. I'm so excited about what well, we're doing yeah. at our school. It's hard, but it's great. Indeed, thank you, Mary. I'm hearing basically SEL for the principals, SEL for the staff, SEL for the adults. It's, mm -hmm. I was looking through some of the questions in the chats, like it's SEL for slowing us too. down, yeah. SEL for us too. Thanks, Stephanie. I'm gonna take it back to you then, Stephanie, on SEL. Um, could you tell us a little bit about whether we're talking for adults, but you're more focused on what's going on with the students in the classroom, perhaps. Has there been a change in um, thinking about SEL? Because I know, I think as we're going into the pandemic, a lot of the focus, a lot of the conversation was around like when we return, it's going to mm. be focused on SEL. Um, and this is where the conversation has been focused on now. Is that really the case? What's going on? What are you seeing? And what are your thoughts? So um, SEL as a, as a, a focus and um, something that is more typically recognized as central to learning is not... Mm -hmm. Uh, in competition with, but a compliment to, um, has been it has been happening for a decade. Uh, I think the the experience of the pandemic um, sort of fronted all of the challenges that all of us were having, establishing and maintaining and connecting, and over the screens and all of the things that we were doing. Some of us uh, at home with kids doing our jobs, and kids are around and really seeing the kinds of behavioral and social emotional stuff that comes up in those kinds of moments, especially when families and adults and kids are stressed. So I think the, the experience of the pandemic sort of laid it bare and um, it became ever more clear how important those sort of foundational self-regulation skills, those um, essential kind of 
conversational, emotional skills, perspective taking, all of those things became really clear. And, and there was a lot of questions about how can we even do this work with kids and with each other over screens? And, and I would say that we, we learned a lot about connecting and asking questions and allowing time for kids to share their experiences, how they're feeling, for adults to share their experiences, how they're feeling. I changed my teaching uh, during that first year and last year to give more time, especially at the beginning, to just let everybody tell, like, let's just let, let's let the stuff in, like how we're feeling and what's happening into the room. And, and I think that what we'll take forward is to preserve some of that because it, it makes a difference. It brings everybody together. It builds those core relationships that Paul was talking about. And it helps kids kind of exercise the stuff that's inside that they need some help getting out so that they can turn their gaze to whatever the task is that's in front of them. And so I think the thing that's going to be different is we might be thinking about SEL, I hope, in a kind of everyday way, as opposed to uh, every Tuesday, we'll do the SEL lesson way. And so um, what I would like to see, and I think what people are asking for it is simple stuff that they can weave into their instructional work or weave into the rituals of the everyday, which is, you know, have a feeling circle when everybody comes in. Adults do this, kids do this. It's a quick way to bring everybody together, talk about how we're feeling, and then go on to the next thing. It's not, it's not long, it's not intensive, but it is a way to bring some of this language and some of this work into the room. So right. I'm thinking of SEL as something that becomes far more integrated. Embedded. And as I said, embedded every day. Hmm. Interesting. Thank you. Um, so Paul, I, I'm curious as you're listening to all of this, you've written about this kind of idea of a Sputnik moment, this transformational change in our educational system. And from what I'm hearing, the last 19 months or so have kind of shaken loose some of the existing routines and un unearthed some like inequities and some issues that are just laid bare and made more clear. So I'm curious as to what you're thinking in terms of these transformational changes. Like, are we in a better situation? Has there been any changes that are more structural that you're seeing? What are your thoughts about how we go from here? Thanks, Uche. Um, well, I, you know, I've likened the, um, the trauma of the pandemic to uh, an earthquake um, that um, reduces a lot of what we've been doing to rubble and forces us to have to start over. At the same time, it generates a tidal wave. And one of the things that happened with the tidal wave is it lifted the ocean off the ocean floor to reveal to the general public what a lot of us who work in education know, but isn't broadly understood, which is the lives of people who are at the bottom of the socioeconomic ladder and uh, the gross inequities that exist in their day-to-day -day lives in terms of access to food and shelter and internet and all the, um, you know, all the amenities that we associate with middle-class life. We had a, a sort of public reckoning with that and a sense of urgency in the public because they thought schools were taking care of all these things. But schools were never really built to be nutritional centers or mental health centers or healthcare centers. They were built to be academic institutions. But suddenly when schools closed, people started to say, well, what's going to happen to all these things? And schools did the best job they could, as they've always done, in trying to put a Band-Aid on some of these grosser inequities that result from poverty and other circumstances of disadvantage that exist in our society and that fall along racial and economic lines. So suddenly that's in front of people and it becomes readily apparent that what we've been asking schools to do all these years, achieve world-class standards while at the same time attend to the holistic being of children and do it on 20% of their waking hours between kindergarten and grade 12, it's just an unrealistic ask. And educators have borne the burden of this, which is why you know, the, the, the stress levels are so over the top, is one of the reasons stress levels are so over the top. So I think if we come to that conclusion that schools alone can't do the job, 
The next step is to move to the broader conception of it's going to take a village to do this. This is a civic responsibility. This is a community responsibility. Our community can't thrive unless our children are successful. Our children can't be successful simply with the intervention of school, which is necessary, but not sufficient to achieving equity, to achieving all means all, every child a winner, whatever. Uh, whatever way we want to sum up our aspirations. So um, this business of bringing communities together to think about children's well-being and to do what needs to be done so every child can go to school every day ready to learn, you know, free from trauma, free from the disadvantages of uh, whatever circumstances they're facing, and that they can be met at the door and dealt with as individuals meet every child where they are and give them what they need. Every child deserves to be seen and heard, to be understood and responded to and to be advocated for within the system. So we've got to move to personalization. We're still on an old factory model from the early 20th century. One size fits all, batch processing, mass producing education. We've got to figure out a way to to do what medicine does is we do a we do a diagnostic on each individual that takes into account their assets and needs and we prescribe solutions that fit them. And in the pandemic, our children's experiences have been so different from the children who've had two professional parents at home and every technological device and after school and, mm -hmm. and summer learning and tutoring and recreation and all these things. And those who've been off the grid altogether, unconnected with school in any way. And the notion that we're going to bring them back and treat them all roughly the same in the way in which we approach education, I think is um, passe now. We've got to come up with a new model. So I think there's some opportunities there and there's some work. We've been doing some work at the Ed Redesign Lab on these kinds of problems, how we bring communities together as a community to care for children and their well-being, how we personalize education. And so I see some hopeful trends there in addition to things like technology and family engagement and other uh, approaches that school systems have actually gotten better at in many instances during the pandemic. Um, and uh, uh, so I'm hopeful uh, that we can move forward and resist. There's some the pressure. questions in the chat actually following up. If Can you talk about a few examples, perhaps from your work with the Redesign Lab, positive examples of what you're Sure. What you're seeing. Well, one of our graduates um, in, in the EDLD program went down to um, the Nashville, Met Metro Nashville public school system and took with her an idea that we've been working on in the lab for some years of personalizing education, of developing a success plan for each child and pairing them with a navigator from the school system, a teacher, an administrator, a mm -hmm. trusted adult from the community who follows them over a period of multiple years. Uh, and the idea was that... Um, in, in, uh, in Nashville, every child would get a success plan. So now 60,000 students have a success plan. There are 6,000 navigators and they're in the early stages of working this through. So we don't have the results yet, Andrew. We're gonna try and figure out how to measure that and what makes a difference. Uh, but um, you know, the beginning, you know, this is as much about relationships as it's about results that nobody's anonymous anymore. Every child deserves to be seen. And uh, so they all have somebody who follows them and they have a portfolio that sums up their assets, their needs, both inside and outside of school and creates a prescription that adults not only work for for that individual, but when we aggregate that up for the system, it begins to point in the directions that that community as a whole needs to move if it wants to do better at meeting its young people's needs. Uh, we see that there are gaps in the cradle to career pipeline um, that show up when we put all the data together from what comes from that. So we've been working in districts all across the country that have been experimenting with, you know, it's, it's, it's easy to say we should move from a uh, you know, factory model to personalization, but people say, well, what do you do Monday morning? We've developed some <laughs> toolkits and some maps for how you do that. And people are now experimenting and we're trying to create communities of professionals who are learning as they go and trying to figure this out. Hmm, thank you. As you were talking, I was watching the reaction of, our, of your fellow panelists. So I'd love, um, Andrew and Mary, if you had any thoughts, or Stephanie, you were either nodding or smiling. So any thoughts on what Paul has been talking about in terms of putting it all together moving forward. And then I do want to turn to some questions that I'm seeing in the Q&A. The whole idea about um, paying attention to kids so they can navigate the system 
what Paul is calling the personalized plan. Mm -hmm. uh, we're working with the principal at Centennial High School in Columbus, Ohio. And she has what she calls a tracker, not to be confused with tracking children, but she pays attention from freshman year, whoever looks like they might not be getting all of their points. They each get a personal guide, a navigator in Paul's terms. And that person works with mm -hmm. the students through their whole four years, works with the family. She publishes this so that they all, everybody knows what's going on. They have dramatically increased their academic achievement and dramatically increased their graduation rate. So mm -hmm. I think it's working. Her whole thought was, she told this story about herself. She said, I graduated from a high school with 545 of my best friends. And I think if I were put in the lineup at my school, there isn't one administrator who could name me. And she said, I wasn't gonna become a principal of a school where there were kids nobody knew. It gets to SEL, it gets to academic achievement and graduation mm -hmm. rates, it gets to Paul's navigation. So she wanted to change that and she has done it. Very impressive. So it's working, what Paul is suggesting. Thank you, Andrew, Stephanie. Yeah, I, I mean, I'll just add that um, that one of the dangers in uh, citing average statistics uh, is that they mask um, what are in this case is substantial increases in variation, which is to say it's the inequality, it's the inequality, it's the inequality, right? Um, and uh, that, that we might lose sight of that and just to have blanket solutions um, would be, would be a, a real missed opportunity. At the same time, you could go back to this idea of deficit-based versus asset-based framings, right? Um, that we have, we have to be very, we have to think about it in terms of, of providing the safety net that everybody deserves so that if things like, hap like this happen in the future, because we anticipate increasingly that they will, um, that that um, some of some of us are much more vulnerable um, than than others, and um, and schools and communities are part of that solution. Just to emphasize what Paul said too, in that handbook that I pasted uh, the link into, there are, are uh, many many um, efforts related to community collaborations is is one of the links. Um, mentoring um, and trying to just build relationships or at their mental health interve interventions is one of the links there. Um, so this is actually I think a quite exciting time. Um, for for an and an opportunity for innovation, um, uh, and I hope that um, that alongside all the other measures that we have, that hopefully will chart our recovery. Um, that test scores will be one of them. Hopefully, a lighter touch version than the past twenty years, uh, but nonetheless, um, one of the many multiple measures that deserve to be part of our system. My my lingering question remains that when the sort of three year window of funding uh, ends, what will we do next to make sure that those um, solutions are sustained and that we continue to learn from them. Uh, but I nonetheless am um, excited for the next three years um, and hope that we can use the data we have, all data on deck, right, uh, to, uh, to, to chart a path uh, to, um, to, to thriving. Uh, a quick comment on the on the resources. I think that's so important. And Andrew mentioned this point earlier. I mean, I, I think the test data, I did a lot of media work yesterday. And I was one of the things I said is these test results are valuable because they help point us towards strategies that we need to remedy the problems that we, uh, uh, you know, that, that, that have developed over this past period of time. I think if we design some of these solutions with the people who are on the receiving end of them, the families and the children, we will build sufficient demand, for example, for personalization in the system over a course of two or three years that when the cliff comes in terms of the federal funding, that there'll be sufficient demand at the state and local level, at the local and state level, that um, policymakers and, and leaders will be forced to make budgetary commitments to sustain some of these interventions. Mm. Stephanie looked like you wanted to get in. I mean, I guess I two random thoughts that are related and unrelated, perhaps. I, I feel like it's important when we talk about personalization to think about what is core, like what's really essential for everyone and what we can adapt. And because um, we need both in order to make a personalization plan feasible. Um, so that's one thing that's on my mind. And that's that might require thinking really very differently about all the things that we do. I, I agree. The second random thought is that I agree with Andrew, like, and Paul, whoever said this, which is that the data are helpful. <laughs> like they tell us something, but we can use it to do the same thing and talk in the same way about gaps and all this stuff, or we can use it to do something different. And, and getting to the something different in the context of disruption and pressure and worry about resources disappearing um, is hard. We have to be intentional. We have to slow down. 
We have to do a little bit of the letting and the slowing down ourselves in order to arrive at that different way of thinking about how to use the data to do something different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And to those of you who are um, posting questions in the Q&A, I've been watching some of them and tracking to see when they come up. And I think these amazing panelists have actually addressed some of those questions before they were even asked. I do wanna go back to that poll that we asked for earlier in the discussion. So um, Pete just posted it. So remember mm -hmm. the question like was, what are, your primary, what are the primary concerns you have for your students? So A was physical health, COVID, B social emotional health, mental health, and C academic health. And B, social emotional, um, the relational piece, I mean, this is where was the strongest. But that again, there are a lot of people who are focused on that physical health. And in the, um, I remember the hierarchy or the prioritization that Andrew talked about earlier, he was talking about you have to have that fundamental base. You do have to put your oxygen mask on. And then the academic. And again, we're asking people to pick one. So it's, it's not one or the other, as Andrew, you talked about. I wonder if you all have any thoughts on these responses? I'll say, I'll start by saying I'm not fully surprised by this. Um, I do think it's hard with the forced choice because we've all just been making the case that they're really mm -hmm. intertwined. Mm -hmm. So, so with that said, yes. <laughs> we'll just remember <laughs> that they're deeply intertwined. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not really surprised. Some of our work with the early learning study at Harvard with, with children who are entering elementary school age from their, their educators and from their parents suggest that children are really struggling in this area in particular, and that the loss of connection, the loss of routines, the loss of some of these rituals has made it harder, the disruption in those things, to use one of the suggestions in the chat, the disruption of all of those things has made it really challenging for kids. And that they're, that they're, they're showing it, they're showing us the stresses that we are all experiencing, they're the barometers of the stress of, of our situation. And so, so I'm not surprised. I think that, that just as we need a new model for some of these other things, I do think we need a little bit of a new model for how we do work in social and emotional learning. We need to think about it as integral, as opposed to an add-on. We need to think about it in the everyday way that I was describing, which is through sort of sh sh short, bits and weaving them into other instructional opportunities. So, so we'll need to rethink all of that also, but there's lots out there to draw from. So it's not like we're starting fresh. As others have said, Uche, I mean, we don't have the luxury of being able to make a choice between those things because we're dealing with whole children. And so we, we have the children. I guess one of the lessons that has been learned during this period of time, I think, is something that schools have been pretty good at in the past, but we'll have to get better at. And I think communities will have to get better at, which is forming partnerships, because we can't do all of those things and be successful. Schools by themselves can't do the whole job of healthcare for young people. They can't do the entire wraparound that it would take to ensure social and emotional well-being. Um, they can, I mean, their, their sweet spot is the academic area, but even on that, we need help outside of school because kids are gonna need more time. Kids need mm -hmm. their families to be engaged. Community organizations, we need to deepen the learning process. So on all of these things, we need to welcome partners to the work and we need partners to come forward to assist. Mm -hmm. And before, Mary, you jump in, so we're talking about what are people's concerns for their students. I want to ask the same question and have another poll, which is what are your concerns for yourself? So same, um, more similar options. What is your primary concern for yourself this school year? So go ahead and start filling it out. And Mary, if you wanted to jump in, and then we'll maybe discuss a little bit about that. Thanks very much, Uche. Um, I think Paul is right on the money about getting partnerships, and especially partnering with families. And one of the things we learned through COVID is that we now have this new way called Zoom or whatever the other ways we have of talking to parents on a screen, which saves parents traveling to the school, trying to find a place to park, maybe not having the cab fare to get to the school. And most schools report much more family engagement at PTO meetings, at parent council, um, at other events that the school is running. So I think that's a real positive. And I love the way Stephanie is talking about the social emotional learning and like doing something in a circle. 
are doing something that you're paying attention to it. But we can't ever forget that we are the education arm of cities, towns, states, countries. Our job is to deliver a fantastic academic program where all students can reach their potential and can excel. And we have sold so many of our students shop, particularly you know, our black indigenous people of color, students with special needs, and we can do so much better. I love the SNHU commercial where the president says, talent is distributed equally, but opportunity is not. And we are the opportunity and option arm. Um, and we have to focus on the academics. Uh, I had the experience of being a principal in a school where the SEL was very high. The faculty loved the kids, the kids loved the faculty, but the academic achievement was the 25th lowest of the 26 schools in the district because they thought they just had to care about the kids. And really that all had to be changed, which we did change because people can give a strong academic program and do the SEL. So I think we're on track here to do both and. Mm -hmm. well, that's great. Thank you, Mary. Um, we just popped up, thank you, Pete, for showing the re your responses to your primary concerns for yourself. And I think a little bit of the conversation where Mary was going is actually touching a little bit on that. So the options were physical health, mental health, support for your school district and community leaders, training skills, um, building to respond to new norms, and then of course, your family finances, employment and health and wellness. So this was a little bit more evenly distributed. So mental health, training skill, building to respond to new norms and family finances were actually relatively even. Um, physical health and support for school districts and community leaders were um, a little bit lower. So nine and 15% respectively. I'm curious as to what people are thinking. Uh, people being our esteemed panelists. Um, we don't have much time for response, maybe a quick thought in parting. Yeah, I, I'll just reflect briefly on this like um, training skill building to respond to new norms. Yeah, I, I, I think that, you know, yeah, it's like as we try to think about Zoom etiquette as we're about to close down this Zoom session, which we, <laughs> we didn't even know what that meant two years ago. Yes. Um, but uh, but I, I do um, want to, you know, as, as proficient as I think many of us have become and a lot of my teaching now happens on this platform, I do hope we can continue to listen to um, not only our uh, our kids, but also um, junior folks uh, in the field as we think about um, how comfortable some of us may be in this uh, environment and why. Um, so I, I actually think that um, the more established we are, the more comfortable we are relying on these little circles and squares because people know us um, and uh, we have already have established relationships. I think we need to often put ourselves in the shoes of people um, or, or ourselves when many decades ago when we didn't have these connections and networks um, and needed to run into people um, mm -hmm. if you happen to stand at the elevators in, in the Gutman Library and, and connect with people and build relationships. And so as we go off and build new, new norms, I also think we should, in some sense, it should return to, um, to old ones or listen to particularly um, the people with less power who need those um, norms to, to, to advance and improve their opportunity. So that, that was, you know, that's one thing that I would reflect on is like, I worry in this time that we're becoming a little too comfortable with um, the convenience because all the people who find it convenient are already comfortable. And I, I wanna put ourselves in the shoes of our, our kids who need to have these connections as well as junior people in professions who need to establish connections the way we did it once upon a time. And, and a Zoom happy hour just isn't quite the same, is it? No, it is not. <laughs> Paul, what do you think? I, well, I have been saying to students lately, you know, if you worked on developing uh, muscles of resilience and flexibility and adaptability to new circumstance over the past 18 months, keep them tuned up because we're not out of the woods yet. And there are going to be true. a lot of other changes that we're going to have to, uh, uh, you know, meet and, uh, and face challenges along the way. And, uh, and we're going to need to have plan B, plan C, plan D, and we're going to need to be flexible in order to move there. And so I think that, you know, it's a perfectly legitimate set of concerns that people have equally distributed around here. And we all have to be thinking about those things. Again, we don't have the luxury of, of jettisoning any of them, but, uh, Overall, we're going to have to we're going to have to really live into the kind of flexibility and adaptability that we've developed over the past 18 months. Thank you, Stephanie. 
It just, the poll suggests to me that we're all worried about all of these things. <laughs> like it's, <laughs> it's, it's pretty evenly distributed in a sense, more so than the other one. And mm -hmm. it just suggests that we're all facing quite a bit right now. And, and we should, we should know that and, and share it and be able to talk about it. That's one way to address some of those fears. In addition to being ready and adaptable, mm -hmm. should just we should say like it's we're all facing these, and that's okay. Let's work on it together. <laughs> Thank you, and Mary. I think be kinder and gentler, even to yourself, um, and give yourself a break. There's no perfection or no perfect way to do any of these things. When you get stuck and you need a new perspective. Imagine you're lost in a maze or you're lost somewhere in a city that's unfamiliar or you're in a rural area, you don't know where to go. If you pretend you're in a helicopter and you get that bird's eye view and you're looking down, you might say, well, there's really an easy exit here. Or there's some different way I could go or a different way that I could look at things. And we need to look at things differently. We have a lot of challenges in not going away. Um, Andrew Paul suggested there are gonna be so many more of these uh, and we need to be resilient and empathetic kind, caring, and um, looking out for one another. Thank you so much. And thank you, all of you, Andrew, Stephanie, Paul, Mary. Excellent conversation. And to all of you who are watching and listening in, I hope you found at least something that was inspiring, that got you thinking, uh, perhaps some connections that you made. Thank you for joining the conversation today. We will have future conversations. You can stay in touch and check out both this recording past conversations with Ed Now and future conversations at hgsc.me forward slash ednow. That's hugsy.me forward slash Ed Now. Um, and you can also check out our YouTube and Facebook page to find out more. But again, thank you so much for joining us. And Paul, Andrew, Stephanie, Mary, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you for thank you for having moderator. us. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, you, <laughs> you did all. a wonderful job. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye, all. Bye. -bye. Bye.